Good evening, my name is Octavio Garaycochea. I'm a senior resident of ENT at the University Clinic of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. And in this opportunity, I'm gonna like to share with you this oral communication that is one of the research projects that we're doing in our voice lab. And the title is Proposal of a new, for, for a new classification for the diagnosis and follow-up of muscle tension dysphonia. This is the index of the presentation that I'm gonna be, that I'm gonna share with you. So introduction, MTD or muscle tension dysphonia was first described in Morrison in 1983. It's considered a functional voice disorder that is characterized by the excessive tension of the extralateral jaw muscles during phonation in the absence of a neurological or organic disease. It's important to highlight that this disorder accounts between the 10 and 40% of all the, all the clinical caseloads at a voice clinic. And how the diagnosis for MTD is made? Well, basically, as any other voice disorders, it's, it's, it's done through a comprehensive, a comprehensive assessment basing three main components, the patient history, the physical examination, which is basically the fibrolaryngoscopy and stroboscopy, and the voice, speech, and language evaluation. In some institution also, the, the instrumental assessment can be also helpful, like the radiology, electromyography, but also acoustic and aerodynamics. The uh, aerodynamic assessment of the voice is going to give us values such as subglottic pressure, transglottic flow, or laryngeal resistance, other than they're very useful for diagnosis of MTD. But in most of hospital centers, the diagnosis will be basically be done through patient history, physical examination, and the voice, speech, and language evaluation. So physical examination in basically fibrolaryngoscopy gospel is very useful for diagnosis of MTD. But how is the diagnosis of MTD made through fibrolaryngoscopy? Well, to today, there are three main classification systems that have, that have been described for the diagnosis or follow-up of patients with MTD. The first one was described in 86 by Ramach and Morrison. The second one was described in 87 by Van Lawrence. The last one was, was described in 91 by Jamie Kaufman. But the thing is, there's no international consensus of which classification systems we use for the diagnosis or follow-up of the patients. All of the three classification systems previously described, they're all based in clinical history, perceptual acoustic assessments, voice-related voice musculoskeletal features, psychological evaluation, but none of them were based in objective measures. And there are like multiple terms that might be confusing or the same clinical pattern is, is referred to different name in the different classification. So at the end, it might be a little bit confusing. In a previous study that we re that realized in our voice lab, we studied the three classification system and we analyzed them. We, we related them to two abnormal uh, aerodynamic studies and we arrived to the conclusion that the clinical features that were more related to an abnormal aerodynamic study uh, assessment was the ventricular fold contribution to phonation, the anterior posterior compression of the larynx and the lateral compression of the larynx. So based with this information, what we decided to do was to propose a new classification that it's actually based in the three previous classification, but it's only using, it will only use the clinical features. They're more related to MTD and they are more related also to an abnormal aerodynamic voice assessment, material and method. So we perform a prospective cross-section of the study which we include 37 consecutive patients with MTD, all of them with altered aerodynamic profile, all of them had more than 90 mmH of 2 osmotic pressure. We exclude patients with underlying stroke lab normalities, including those abnormalities related to glottal insufficiency, or we, we exclude also patients with neurological abnormalities or acute medical conditions such as upper airway infections. So regarding clinical features, as primary features, we assess the supraglottic anterior posterior and lateral compression, and as a secondary feature, we also assess the posterior glottal gap. So with the hypothesis that a major grade of supraglottic compression might be related with a higher level of supraglottic pressure, we divide the anterior posterior compression in three different grades, grade one, grade two, and grade three. Grade one was divided into grade one A and grade one, grade one B. Grade one A, we cannot see the commissary anterior during definition because of the contraction, um, um, anterior posterior contraction. Grade one B, we cannot see the vocal process due to the rotation of the arytenoid during the speech task. In grade two, we only see two thirds of the vocal cord. And in grade three, we see less than one third of the vocal cord. 
And regarding lateral compression, grade one, we're not allowed to see the laryngeal ventricles. In grade two, we see that the ventricular folds are in contact with, the, with, in, with each other at some point or during some point of the speech task. And in grade three, the ventricular four are in contact with, you, with, it, with each other constantly during all the speech task. This is how we perform the aerodynamic voice assessment, the acoustic voice assessment, and for the voice reality related quality of life, we use the voice hand index. So what we wanted to do at the end was measure the relationship between the compression grade of anterior posterior and lateral compression with the voice handicap index and the subglottic pressure value. So what are our results? The mean age of the patient was 50 years old. So there was no difference in the subglottic pressure value relation, in relation to the gender and age. In this table, we see all the results of the aerodynamic voice assessments. We see the subglottic pressure was 111.03. This, uh, those are the results of the acoustic voice assessment, also the voice handicap index. We see the mean of the voice handicap index is 27.8. So regarding AP compression, AP compression was present in 34 patients at the 91.8%. The grade of AP compression was correlated with the subglottic pressure value. There was no correlation between the voice handicap index and the AP compression. So this is important here that we see we got a statistically like significant difference in the subglottic pressure value for the different grades of AP compression. We didn't have any statistically significant difference regarding the voice handicap index in the three different grades. Regarding lateral compression, the lateral compression was present in 25 patients. The grade of lateral compression was not, not associated with a higher subglottic value, with a higher value of subglottic pressure. And there was no correlation between the voice handicap index and the lateral compression. So we see here there was no statistically significant difference between the three grades of lateral compression. We also analyzed posterior contact graph. This feature was present in only 12 patients. It was not related to voice handicap index and in the subglot pressure. All the voice handics, all the voice handicap index scores for the patients were high enough to reflect the existence of a voice disorder. And the voice handicap index score was not related to subglottic pressure value. So what are the conclusions we got from this study? Well, the first one is the AP compression is more frequent than lateral compression in patients with MTD. AP compression is related to the subglottic pressure value, and the higher the grade of AP compression, the higher the value of subglottic pressure. It's important. And lateral compression is not related to the subglottic pressure. So with this information, we propose this three classification, AP1, AP2, then this is AP3 here in the corner. So AP1 will, have, will be related with less subglottic pressure value than AP2 and AP3. But in order to have more information about what's going on in the larynx when, during the phonation, the different grades of anterior posterior compression that, they're, that, that, that those are giving us this severity can be accompanied with a different letter, L1, L2, L3, if we have some sort of lateral compression also, or PGG as posterior rotator gap, if we have the present also through local gap. This is important because those, to those letters might give us more information of what's going on with the larynx. So we're not only just assessing anterior posterior or lateral or posterior local gap. So we can create like a formula that is gonna give us more information of what's going on in the larynx during the phonation based on the different grades of anterior posterior compression that they're gonna give us this severity. So what are the benefits of this classification? Well, it's easy to use and to interpret. It's helpful in grading the severity. It's helpful for the evolution and follow up of the patients. And also it provides a way to assemble all the pertinent laryngoscopic findings. So we're not only just using one, we're just describing all what's going on in the larynx. Well, thanks for your attention.